Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton. Welcome to the beautiful woods of Pennsylvania. Right now I'm standing next to a tree that always gets me really excited whenever I find it. This is American Chestnut, and there are a few of these trees scattered about in this wooded area. American Chestnut is a tree that has experienced significant challenges in the past 100 to 120 years. In the early 1900s, a fungal disease known as chestnut blight was found to be infecting living American chestnut trees at the Bronx Zoo in New York City. And within a few decades, nearly every single large American chestnut in eastern North America was either killed by chestnut blight or by humans who, thinking they could help stop the disease from spreading, preemptively cut down large healthy trees. Well, that didn't seem to help too much. And while American chestnut still exists today throughout its native range in Eastern North America, it only really does so as a smaller tree. Now, because American chestnut struggles to reach the sizes it once reached prior to the introduction of chestnut blight, it can be difficult for us to know just how big of a tree American chestnut was in pre-blight Eastern North American forests. We're told, and maybe you've heard, that American chestnut was a dominant tree in many of these forests, and it could reach massive sizes, incredible sizes, towering sizes. Some people have even referred to American chestnut as the redwood of the east. But is this true? Was American chestnut really an exceptionally tall tree in eastern deciduous forests prior to the introduction of chestnut blight? How large in diameter could it get? Is it accurate to refer to American chestnut as the redwood of the east? Or might it be the case that people in recent years have been exaggerating the size of American chestnut in pre-blight forests? Well, those are really good questions. And the answer to the last question is surprisingly, yes. Some people may have exaggerated and still exaggerate the true size of American chestnut in pre-blight Eastern North American forests. Maybe you've even seen some photographs shared online of what are supposedly American chestnut trees when in reality, these trees are redwoods along the west coast of North America. So this definitely adds to the confusion. It turns out that American chestnut was a large tree and an incredibly valuable tree for wildlife and for humans. But on average, it was similar in stature to other Eastern North American trees like Eastern white pine, tulip tree, and even some oaks. All this fascinating information detailing how the true size of American chestnut may have actually been inflated in recent decades was compiled in a fascinating study published in the Journal of Forestry. The researchers in this study analyzed several publications to compare the size and growth rate of American chestnut. And they analyzed two categories of sources, pre-blight sources and post-blight sources. Regarding growth rate, both kinds of sources consistently described American chestnut as a fast-growing tree that grew faster than most other trees in eastern deciduous forests. But sources differed in how they described the height and girth of American chestnut. Pre-blight sources typically reported a maximum height of mature American chestnut as 100 feet. Post-blight descriptions increased this size and most frequently reported a maximum height of 120 feet, with a few sources reporting 130 feet. Pre-blight sources generally describe the typical diameter of a mature tree as between 3 to 7 feet and a maximum diameter of 13 feet. Post-blight sources frequently listed 17 feet as the maximum diameter. Pre-blight sources described American chestnut as being among the tallest trees in eastern forests, but often similar in height to white ash, white oak, sugar maple, and tulip tree, and similar in girth to northern red oak, white oak, American beech, and tulip tree. Post-blight sources tended to portray American chestnut as the tallest tree in eastern deciduous forests, uniquely towering above all others. So what's going on here? What are we to make of all this? Pre-blight sources almost consistently reported large, but still somewhat smaller sizes in both height and girth compared to post-blight sources. Why the discrepancy? Well, the researchers in this study listed a few possible reasons. First, post-blight sources may have confused circumference with diameter. So circumference is the distance around the tree's trunk, usually taken at breast height, and diameter is a measurement of the trunk's width straight across, again, usually taken at breast height. There are multiple post-blight references to a specific American chestnut tree in North Carolina, 
with a trunk diameter of 17 feet, which is huge if you think about it. But in recent decades, multiple ecologists have challenged this measurement and have claimed that the original measurement actually referred to a 17 foot circumference, not diameter. And a 17 foot circumference would equate to a diameter of, let's see, it's always important to carry a calculator with you in the woods. So a 17 foot circumference would equate to a diameter of a little under five and a half feet, which is still a large diameter, but it's more in alignment with pre-blight diameter descriptions of American chestnut. A second reason for the discrepancy between sources is that typical trees might have been confused with exceptional trees. Pre-blight sources often distinguished between the typical size of American chestnut trees and the maximum size an individual might attain. Post-blight sources frequently confused these categories and used descriptions of unusually large trees to represent the typical size of the entire species. As an example, this photograph of American chestnut trees in North Carolina was originally labeled unusually heavy growth, but was later used in publications to represent typical growth. Another reason for the discrepancy between sources is that any questionable descriptions in later sources could not be easily corrected or verified for the simple reason that researchers and authors could no longer measure living mature American chestnut trees and verify historical size reports. Of course, this challenge continues today. Ultimately, it seems that the post-blight, slightly romanticized view of American chestnut as an unrealistically large, mega-giant redwood of the East might be an inaccurate representation. According to the authors of this study, pre-blight sources appear to provide a more accurate representation of American chestnut's stature than post-blight sources. On the basis of historical descriptions and data, American chestnut was a tall tree within pre-blight forests, but it shared this position with ash, oaks, pines, sugar maple, and yellow poplar. On the basis of pre-blight diameter measurements and historical photographs, it appears that American chestnut was a large diameter tree within historical forests, but it shared this position with oaks, beech, and yellow poplar. So yes, American chestnut was a large tree in pre-blight forests. It was an incredibly valuable tree for wildlife and for humans. And it is a bummer that we can't just walk into a forest today and find a few remnant old growth patches of American chestnut. But I do think it is oddly reassuring to know that American chestnut wasn't some otherworldly species that defied all biological constraints. It existed, it thrived, it provided, and its diminishment today is a good reminder that significant changes can drastically reshape the landscape seemingly in an instant. I believe American chestnut will adapt to chestnut blight and regain prominence in Eastern North American forests over time. I don't think it'll happen quickly. In the meantime, we can be grateful that this species is still here on the landscape with quite a story to tell. It's also a story I believe that isn't even close to being finished. Thanks so much for watching this video. I truly appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you want to support this channel, please subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. Head on over to learnyourland.com. Sign up for the email newsletter so that we can stay in touch and check out my online courses on ecology, tree identification, and mushroom foraging. Thanks again for watching. I will see you on the next video.